welcome. Thank you. Thank you for uh, pointing out, Rohit. Uh, so I'm going to talk on management of strabismus after in thyroid eye disease. So it's uh, thyroid eye disease basically has two uh, clear phases. There is an acute inflammatory phase with a lymphocytic infiltration and congestion of the orbital tissue, which in if the patient presents at that time can have pain, ocular movement restriction and diplopia. And then it leads to a chronic phase later on uh, with adipose tissue infiltration and fibrotic changes of the ocular muscles leading to restrictive strabismus. So it affects a nearly Different studies quote different numbers, but anywhere from 17 to 51 percent of the patients with thyroid eye disease are uh, likely to have strabismus. However, I don't know if I'm wrong here, but we see we seem to see less strabismus in thyroid patients from India. Uh, I I don't see it as much as it is reported in the Western literature. Uh, risk factors again: middle age women. Uh, smoking. Smoking is a very, very important risk factor and uh, this study by Rajendran et al. Have, has uh, reported that uh, who are smokers with thyroid eye disease are twice as likely to need strabismus surgery and of course some amount of family history and genetics also plays a role in this uh, thing. So this is the usual clinical presentation, proptosis, lid retractions, esotropia, Mm, sometimes uh, orbital, uh, not sometimes, very often uh, compressive neuropathy and um, other uh, corneal involvement in severe cases. Uh, etopathogenesis, probably autoimmune, but other uh, factors which can interplay are genetic factors, environmental factors like smoking, uh, type of thyroid eye, eye disease, uh, th sort of, thought of type of thyroid disorder, and of course the immune response. So this is another typical patient who will uh, sometimes uh, motility limitation can be both vertical as well as horizontal, as you can see in this patient, has isotropia as well as hypotropia in the affected eye. It can be symmetrical as well as asymmetrical and uh, almost world over inferior rectus is most commonly involved muscle followed by medial rectus, though other muscles rarely can be involved like superior rectus, lateral rectus and even obliques. Inferior rectus, probably because it is very bulky and tonically active muscle, uh, is probably most prone for inflammatory changes and the fibrotic changes which result from thyroid eye disease. Uh, as I said, individual muscle involvement can be unpredictable. It can be asynchronous as well as asymmetric. But the hallmark of myopathy is almost always a restriction uh, at a later stage. These are the investigations which you would like to do in these patients. Imaging is very important and it shows very clearly the tendon sparing fusiform enlargement of the muscle and a short tau inversion recovery MRIs often give you a clue about disease activity, which plays an important role in timing of the uh, surgery, especially strabismus surgery. It demonstrates your muscle involvement and also gives you an idea about the optic nerve status, um, compression of the optic nerve. CT scan or ultrasounds also can be done but they are less helpful. So this is a typical MRI which shows a T2A image which shows uh, bulky muscle. And uh, you can see here if your rectus is really enlarged as well as the medial rectus. These are the differential diagnosis. Myasthenia gravis can really coexist as well as can mimic uh, thyroid of thermopathy and this needs to be ruled out. Uh, in silent orbitopathy, sometimes can mimic uh, cranial nerve palsies and of course other inflammatory conditions like myositis and orbital inflammation, idiopathic orbital inflammations can also mimic thyroid eye disease. Management is usually divided into non-surgical and surgical and these are the options in the non-surgical management. Uh, you can have medical management in terms of uh, uh, steroids which are very effective in uh, controlling the inflammation, but are less effective in controlling or uh, alleviating the diplopia which these patients may have in the active phase of the disease. Radiation has been tried. Botulinum toxin has again, re there is a renewed interest in the botulinum toxin. Prisms can be given in active phase and sometimes can be a definitive treatment for small angle strabismus. And recently, Epratumumab, which is a, um, insulin growth uh, factor uh, 
receptor uh, one antibody which acts on that and is uh, has given a very very hopeful uh, treatment option for patients who are in active phase of the disease in terms of both proptosis as well as diplopia and the quality of life so as I, as i said earlier prisms can be a definitive treatment in small angle it can be both frenal or ground in prisms and it can be also be tried in patients who are waiting for surgery botulinum toxins re recurrent injections may be required difficulty in precise delivering the agent within the orbit with a very enlarged inflamed orbit is difficult but it can be a choice in poor surgical candidates which cannot be treated with prisms so up to 5 units of dosage has been described in the literature and often more than one injection may be required and it is probably ineffective when the muscles are in already fibrotic so these are the surgery indications and as i said earlier that surgery probably should be reserved for patients who are really have large angles who have very cosmetically unacceptable strabismus or have abnormal head positioning with intractable diplopia so challenges of the surgery in these patients are because of variable outcomes we don't have very good um um base to assess how active is the disease muscles can be tight bulky conjunctiva is often friable and tends to tear there is incompetence especially sometimes even between the primary and the down gaze and surgical dose calculation is always a challenge in these patients so here our surgical goals should be clearly to achieve substantial field of binocular single vision and we really focus on primary gaze and the down gaze and if possible sometimes now the goals have been enlarged to just uh, enlarge the binocular diplopia free field can also be considered as a acceptable goal of surgery so surgical dose calculation we follow this dictum uh, by jampolski and smaller angles often need larger recessions and larger angle need smaller recession compared to uh, traditional strabismus surgery where it's all, almost the opposite timing of surgery it has to be either stable angles for at least 6 months or if the disease is quiescent uh, and if orbital decompression is planned you plan strabismus surgery after that and of course muscle edema using t2 weighted images also can be a marker for stability of the disease but despite that sometimes patients have had uh, continued activity despite showing quiescent disease on mri so that needs to be talked to the patient so surgery usually it's a resection of the tighter muscles and resection is usually better avoided but may have to be considered in large angles uh, as in this paper you can which has reported so sometimes resections we do uh, use employ resections for significant isotro residual isotropia or hypotropia after we have resected the muscles and adjustable sutures again a little bit of a controversial thing because adjustable sutures sometimes tend to cause late over corrections as well as uh, a little bit of slippage of muscles is common in these patients with bulky muscles uh, inferior rectus again definitely probably the consensus is to avoid adjustable sutures and probably a non non absorbable sutures probably give better surgical results so when you plan surgery patient counseling is very important realistic expectations and you have to counsel the patients that proptosis and lid retraction may actually worsen after surgery uh, multiple surgeries may be required this is an important thing even after strabismus is corrected these patients reoperation rates can increase over the time uh, when we are considering we have to consider all three primary secondary and tertiary actions of the each muscle and are important to take into the account fusional range consideration uh to see if there is a previously hypotropic muscle with a small hypodeviation ocular torsion is very important especially if you are dealing with inferior rectus in these patients so this is important to document and lot of times more than the angle measurements probably post action test on the table uh, is probably more important than anything else in surgical decision making so intraoperatively as i said earlier post actions at the beginning of surgery and probably after muscle is disinserted also large muscle resection also should be combined with conjunctival resections to avoid post operative restriction through conjunctival tethering 
and a good dissection of penis capsule in and around the intraductus muscle is really important. Um, challenges during surgery, friable conjunctiva, muscles are tight and pulled in two syndrome has been reported. You can use special hooks like Wright's hook or Wilson's hook to use these, uh, hook these muscles. Sometimes a 15 bar Parker knife blade is required to cut these muscles because there is, it's not possible to insert a genotomy scissor under these muscles. And sometimes hang back approach is, semi-adjustable hang back approach is better for larger recessions. So these are the uh, two things. This is a Fechner forcep, which you can use to hold the conjunctiva because this conjunctiva really tends to uh, cut through. And a double uh, uh, is sometimes important if you're doing recession. This allows us to create some space between the muscle and the sclera to insert your scissors. Intraoperative released uh, relaxed muscle technique, which has been proposed by Del Canto, has been very useful. And you, uh, once the muscle is disinserted, it is allowed to uh, slip back to as much possible in the globe and uh, with the globe held in primary position. And this has proved the surgical success rate of much superior to uh, traditional recessions. So surgical outcomes can, uh, in this patient, as you can see, is a very large hypo in the left eye. And I'm sorry, but picture is a little bit reversed. We did operate on the left eye only. And as you can see, with just one inferior rectus recession, patient has of that two not very large, some five millimeter recession, we were able to give him diplopia free field with not much restriction in the down gaze. And patient was happy with just one, while as traditional teaching here would, in, would, would we would think that you will need two muscle or multi more surgery. Complications of surgery, overcorrections, especially late overcorrections are very common. Uh, marked postoperative inflammation, lower lid retraction, and, a and the most difficult to deal with is a pattern exotropia, which these patients, especially with bilateral recessions, inferior rectus recessions, very common. Uh, so these are the reasons why inferior rectus recession can cause late overcorrection. Muscle slippage has been known. And one way of reducing the late overcorrection is to either combine it with contralateral superior rectus muscle recession, using a non-absorbable suture, and uh, to match the duction by doing a forced action, uh, by doing a uh, hardens procedure on contralateral and uh, anticipating and uh, probably talking to the patient about uh, this problem before surgery. Eyelid retraction is also common, so a good dissection and uh, with lockwood ligament or lockwood ligament and lower lid retractors will probably partially solve this problem. Mm. A pattern exotropia again sometimes it rarely superior oblique involvement can worsen this, so this must be kept in mind. Uh, management is usually you can do a prism glass modification, you can reduce the amount of medial rectus recession if it is con consequently a plant along with inferior rectus recession or even delaying staging it, um, medially transposing the recessed inferior rectus, but this comes with a slight risk of worsening the encyclotorsion in, in and uh, sometimes even minimal medical medial transposition of inferior rectus can also take care of, nasal transposition of exotropia can take care of it, but nasal transposition again can worsen the encyclotorsion. So sometimes it is difficult to get everything in one surgery and you may have to counsel the patients before that. So uh, surgical follow-up is required. 50% of these patients can end up with reoperation, which is both because of unstable or evolving disease and unpredictable results. So to summarize, surgery only if it is functionally disabling, um, quiescent stage only, and conservative therapy as much as trial should be given and cessation of smoking definitely should be because it really takes care of uh, worsening of the disease. And maybe standard surgical nomograms to be used carefully, intraoperative FTT, I cannot stress importance of it more, using smaller numbers for bigger angles, recession as far as possible to re avoid resection. And if at all resection is uh, tried, it should be probably limited to the tendon and not really the muscle belly and adjustable sutures if you are comfortable with that. Thank you for that.